thank you for joining me to, today. My name is Aaron, and in this episode of Learning with Human Kinetics, I'm going to talk about power development and training for power. Now, if you watched the previous episode on understanding muscle fibers, this will build off of that and specifically in terms of type 2 or fast twitch muscle fibers. If you didn't have a chance to watch that episode, do a quick search on our YouTube channel uh, or look it up under the playlist section. If you haven't already, uh, subscribe to our channel and most importantly, click that bell for alerts so that you're notified whenever we upload new videos so that you can stay up to date on the latest information we're putting out in terms of you know, educational content, workout videos, exercise technique videos, or author interviews. Now, like I said, I'm gonna talk about power development and it's important to note that while I might refer to a client as being an athlete, training for power isn't only for competitive athletes. Everyone needs to train for power, whether you are an eight-year-old learning how to navigate a gym or a workout session, or you are 70 or 80-year-old and wanting to stay active and independent for as long as possible. Strength training is important because, as you know, sarcopenia uh, affects many individuals as we age. Um, while we can certainly stay on top of it uh, with consistent strength training, many people as early as their 30s will begin to lose muscle mass and strength. Osteopenia or loss of bone density also plays a role, and this is why it's important to stay consistent uh, with strength training even if we are no longer competitive in sports. With muscle and strength loss, uh, power begins to go as well. Now imagine uh, beginning to you know, struggle to open a car door or not being able to get out of bed. There are things that we do daily that we might take for granted and require strength and power, and if that power is lost, uh, we might no longer be self-sufficient. Um, so how does this all work? If you remember from my previous discussion on fast twitch muscle fibers, a fast twitch motor unit is one that develops force and relaxes rapidly. And because of this, it has a short twitch time. That's why they're called fast twitch. Now, digging a little deeper, um, there are two types of fast twitch fibers, type 2A and type 2X. Now, type 2A fibers have a great, uh, greater capacity for aerobic metabolism and have more capillaries surrounding them uh, compared to type 2X fibers. This means they'll be slower to fatigue uh, compared to type 2X. Now, think of this difference as a soccer player, a 400 meter, 800 meter runner in track, or maybe even a tennis player um, as having a higher recruitment of type 2A fibers. These athletes are going to have a mix, uh, for lack of a better analogy, of power and endurance, but when trained this way, they won't have as much power as an athlete who has a higher recruitment of type 2X muscle fibers. Um, examples of type 2X athletes might be a high jumper or long jumper in track and field, or a football player. Now, a caveat there might be the differences in position, um, but mostly those are going to be type 2X. In other words, these athletes are going to be uh, better, more powerful, more explosive in short bursts as opposed to an event that's going to last a little bit longer. Um, why is all of this important? Now, when training for power, these are the specific muscle fibers that we are targeting and a certain way that we need to train them. Power is used to define the force-speed uh, relationship. Um, in physics, it's defined as the time rate of doing work. Um, where power sometimes gets confusing is in the common definition of power versus the scientific definition. Now, power lifters, for example, um, move heavy weight at high forces, but they generally move that weight slowly compared to an Olympic lifter. Imagine the difference uh, between a lifter doing a slow, heavy deadlift compared to the explosive power produced when doing a barbell cleaner snatch. In this respect, uh, power is the direct function of force and velocity. If an athlete or a lifter can generate high force or high power at a certain velocity, that individual is considered powerful. I remember early on, one of my former program directors from college was overseeing us in a training session uh, with a men's basketball team. Um, we had some hurdles set up and most of them were at a decent height. Now, a couple of the guards were around 6'1 or 6'2, but the majority of the guys on this particular team were between 6'7 and 6'11. Uh, these guys were clearing these hurdles with no problem, so another one of the assistants uh, suggested raising the height. Um, and I remember the exact response. Um, if we raise the hurdles too high, our program director said, 
uh, they'll be able to clear it, but uh, they'll have to slow down in order to do it. We want to train them to be fast. We don't want to train them to be slow. Um, we could have, could we have raised the hurdles? Uh, absolutely. And they would have still looked powerful and jumping over the line of hurdles, uh, but that power would look different. And for them, that wasn't what we were going for. Now, consider a lineman in football um, who needs to be strong and strong enough to battle with an opposing lineman, whether that's offensive or defensive. Uh, when they're battling for position, their velocity is going to be slowed down uh, by the force being exerted by the opposing player. Now, a basketball player, uh, or volleyball athlete, on the other hand, needs to be quick and powerful and explosive in order to run and jump at max velocities. They need quick movements. That's not to say a football lineman uh, doesn't need to be powerful. They certainly need to be explosive off the ball and going into contact with the other player. Uh, but in that specific example, uh, their power is being slowed by the physical contact of an opposing player and strength becomes more important in that case. Uh, this can bring on the debate of which is more important, you know, strength or power, and whether or not strength is needed in order to be more powerful. Now, if you follow or read a variety of sources, uh, you've probably heard this debate. Um, you've probably heard all angles of uh, each side, you know, like suggesting that you don't need to build strength before transitioning to power. And on the other side, that says uh, strength is a major factor in the ability to be more powerful. I don't think it's coincidence, though, that in the traditional periodization model, strength directly precedes power. And if you're working through a natural progression, you will hit a, a strength and power phase combined as a transition between the two. Um, this is one that I personally use in periodization uh, because I think it gives the athlete a proper transition between training for pure strength uh, going into that power phase, and eventually the full competition phase. Um, if you're using percentages uh, for your training for load assignments, your power-based exercises, like uh, hang power clean, for example, might be around 80% of your one rep max, uh, whereas other lifts might be closer to 50 to 70%. Uh, some examples of these uh, lifts or exercises you might do during a power phase are uh, things like a push jerk, um, a push press, a power clean, a power snatch. Now these are all done with a barbell, but it could also be done with kettlebells or dumbbells. For example, a push press, a push jerk, um, a snatch, those can all uh, be done with a barbell uh, or a dumbbell, uh, which is what I actually typically start my athletes with before moving on to a barbell. And the clean can be taught with a kettlebell. Now, we could also include kettlebell swings and a variety of other exercises. Um, you know, just use your imag imagination with these. Um, because these are very powerful movements, the reps on these lifts should stay low. Um, when going for power, I never program anything over five reps per set and try to split up the exercises so that there's plenty of rest between the sets for a particular movement. These exercises are intended to develop power, and in order to do that, maximum recovery is needed so that the athlete is able to produce maximal power in the next set. Um, now, those aren't the only exercises that can be done, of course, and uh, some of the most common exercises to use to develop power are plyometrics. Now, plyometric exercises can largely be done um, without a lot of equipment. Plyometric refers to activities that enable a muscle to reach maximal force in the shortest possible time. Now, plyometric, uh, by definition, is a combination of Greek words that literally mean increased measure. Plyo means more, and metric means measure. Uh, practically defined, a plyometric exercise is a quick, powerful movement using a pre-stretch or a counter movement uh, that involves the stretch shortening cycle. Now we can trace this back to the conversation about muscle fibers and the difference between fast twitch and slow twitch. Um, again, fast twitch fibers are able to produce maximal force uh, and relax quickly. So by definition, a plyometric exercise helps an ind individual reach maximum, maximal force in the shortest amount of time. When used correctly, uh, plyometric training has consistently been shown to improve the production of muscle force and power. The increased production can be explained by two models, uh, the mechanical and neurophysiological. Now, in the mechanical model, elastic energy in the muscular tenderness components is increased with a rapid stretch and then stored. 
When this movement is immediately followed by concentric muscle action, the stored elastic energy is released, increasing the total force production. Uh, most important in the mechanical model is this series elastic component. Uh, if you've been studying uh, kinesiology at all, you're very familiar with this. Uh, this is known as the workhorse of a plyometric exercise. Uh, the tendons constitute uh, the majority of the SEC. When the muscular tendon, tendinous unit is stretched, um, as in an eccentric muscle action, the series elastic component acts as a spring. Now, as it lengthens, uh, elastic energy is stored, and if the muscle starts a concentric action immediately following, uh, the stored energy is released, and that allows the series elastic component to contribute to um, the total force production by naturally returning the muscles and tendons to their unstretched configuration. If a concentric action doesn't happen right away, or if the eccentric or phase is too long, uh, the stored energy dissipates and has lost its heat. Uh, essentially, all that stored energy is lost, and you no longer have the power available uh, that you would have been able to produce. Now, the neurophysiological model involves the potentiation or change in force velocity characteristics of the muscle's actions, uh, muscles contractile components. Uh, the stretch reflex is the body's involuntary response to an external stimulus that stretches the muscles. Uh, this is primarily composed of muscle spindle activity. If you don't know what a muscle spindle is, uh, they are proprioceptive organs that are sensitive to the rate and magnitude of a stretch. Uh, when a stretch reflex is detected, a muscular activity reflexively increases. So during plyometric movements, uh, the muscle spindles are stimulated by a rapid stretch uh, causing a reflexive muscle action. This response increases the activity of the agonist muscle, increasing the force the muscle produces. Um, just as in the mechanical model, uh, if a concentric muscle action doesn't immediately follow a stretch, uh, the ability of the stretch reflex is negated. In other words, if you don't go, go right into a concentric muscle action, you no longer have the power from the energy you thought was stored up. Now, if we're talking about uh, stretch reflexes and the series elastic component, uh, we have to mention the stretch shortening cycle. The stretch shortening cycle has the same energy storage capabilities as the series elastic component, but involves three distinct, uh, distinct phases. Uh, if you stay with me to this point, this is perhaps the most intriguing part of power production. Uh, the stretch shortening cycle involves three distinct, distinct phases. The eccentric phase, uh, the amortization phase, and the concentric phase. Each one is important and the timing of each is crucial. Now, the eccentric phase is the first phase and involves the stretch of the agonist muscle and the storage of energy. In this phase, elastic energy is stored in the series elastic component and muscle spindles are stimulated. Phase two is the amortization uh, phase and is kind of like the pause between uh, phases one and three. Uh, this is where alpha uh, motor neurons transmit signals to agonist muscle groups. Now, phase three is the concentric phase. The concentric phase involves the shortening of agonist muscle fibers. Uh, the elastic energy is released from the series elastic component, and alpha motor neurons stimulate the agonist muscle. Now, this is the body's response to the eccentric and amortization phases. An easy way to think of this uh, process is in a depth jump. So when an athlete steps off the box or a step, the eccentric phase begins, the amortization phase would be when the athlete reaches the floor, and the rebound jump is the concentric phase. In explaining the stretch uh, shortening cycle and the release of energy in this example, the time spent on the floor should be limited. Now, if too much time is spent in this phase, uh, the energy will be lost and the force produced going back up into the jump or concentric phase will be limited. Think of this in terms of a volleyball player. Now, if a volleyball player is going up for a hit or a block, uh, they want to be able to produce maximal force in order to be able to jump as high as possible. Um, when they go up for their approach, the second to last step is going to load the body. The quick step right before takeoff would represent the amortization phase, and the takeoff would be the concentric or the third phase. Uh, if too much time is spent in the amortization phase right before takeoff, the jump won't be as powerful. Uh, this example could also be uh, used in a long jump or high jump in track and field. Um, now, when a jumper is on the apron and approaches the bar for a high jump, the athlete would want to uh, load and slightly lower the center of mass, take a quick step on that second to last or penultimate step, 
uh, and explode for takeoff. The penultimate step in this case is loading the body and the last step right before takeoff would serve as the amortization phase and the takeoff is the concentric movement. Uh, I've unfortunately seen a lot of jumpers fail uh, and attempt uh, because they don't pick up enough speed going into their approach uh, so they aren't able to produce force uh, when they need to and then it's almost like they stop and think about the jump before they actually take off. Now what most, most of you probably are interested in most is programming. You know, how do you program for power? Um, one aspect of programming to consider when planning your power phase is frequency. Uh, frequency refers to the number of power-based training sessions per week. Uh, this obviously depends on the phase and the time of the year for the athlete, but it usually ranges between one and three sessions per week. Uh, perhaps more important than frequency is recovery. Uh, since power-based exercises require a max effort, complete recovery between uh, both sets and sessions is important. For example, uh, for most exercises, you'll want between 5 and 10 seconds of recovery between reps and up to 3 minutes between sets. Um, it's important to distinguish uh, conditioning from power or plyometric training. Um, that's where reps and rest are taken into account. Too little time between sets um, and your power-based session could turn into a conditioning session. Um, that also means controlling the number of reps per set and session. Now, as I mentioned earlier, um, when programming exercises like cleans or snatches or even explosive jumps like a band-resistor broad jump or power jumps or medicine ball exercises, um, I always limit it to about five reps or less. Um, most of the time, a full power phase in a standard period, uh, periodized program might last between six and ten weeks. Now, early on, the program might consist of uh, three to four sets of cleans, for example, with five reps per set. Uh, as the athlete gets closer to peaking in their competitive season, the number of reps will decrease uh, to between one to three per set. I've heard some athletes, and this tends to, for whatever reason, be American football players, um, they will come in to train and say that their coach has them uh, doing cleans for sets of 10 to 12. Now, if you're doing sets of 10 to 12 reps on an exercise like a clean, the load is going to have to be extremely light compared to where you want it, uh, and the power output isn't going to be maximal by the time you get to the end of the set. Uh, for those reasons, a lift like the clean uh, at high reps wouldn't be beneficial to help develop maximal power uh, if the load is light enough and all other safety precautions are taken, uh, you'll probably get in a good amount of conditioning, but there are probably safer ways you can go about conditioning rather than having a, a heavy barbell in the hand, um, especially of a junior high or high school athlete. Um, now, there are many ways to train power, uh, train a power phase of an athlete's programming. Um, it's important to maintain strength uh, through not only this phase, but through competition. And that is why, despite being in a power phase, I always tend to keep main lifts or variations of lifts for main muscle groups and the programming. Now, one approach is to combine power-based exercises with strength exercises. After going through an appropriate warm-up, uh, the athlete might do a combination of cleans or snatches, um, mix them with medicine ball throws and core or mobility work. Uh, that circuit can be followed by a barbell squat or deadlift mixed with band resisted or assisted jumps uh, like broad jumps or hops or bounds or uh, have the session filled with other necessary lifts to work the, you know, the back, the chest, shoulders, any other accessory exercises that the athlete might uh, need to work on. Another approach might be to include complexes. Uh, an example of this would be to include a number of different lifts um, all with the same weight. Now this might be uh, doing a full continuous uh, complex of like say barbell RDLs for five or six reps, uh, going straight into hang power cleans for three to five reps, uh, then to the squats and maybe a push press. Um, I guess this, uh, well this complex, you know, works in a hip hinge, a triple extension, a squat, uh, and a vertical push all in one complex. Um, you could even add in a barbell row, uh, you know, to to work the back in this little complex here. So going back to the idea of frequency and recovery, um, it's very important to get adequate rest following a set of a complex like this. 
a complex variation might actually be the best in some cases for total power and energy output when comparing it to actual game energy production. Now, regardless of the type of programming you choose, uh, recovery between sets, especially between sessions, is crucial. Uh, if you don't allow enough recovery, you will never get the full benefit of a power-based training session. Now, this is tough for some people to think about or at least to follow through with because they're afraid of wasting time. Now, please know that time isn't being wasted necessarily. Um, you're using the time for recovery and to get the biggest benefit out of your session. If it becomes an issue, you can certainly work in a, like a low impact element during rest breaks like working on mobility or accessory uh, work that's not directly impacted by your main lift. Um, not every session has to be filled with non-stop work. I think that's so important to uh, keep in mind. Um, you're still getting benefit. I remember hearing a, a story from a prominent uh, track and field coach uh, talk about a sprint workout that he did with one of his best sprinters. Um, and in a one hour practice, the athlete did a total of one minute of work. Uh, but it was an effective session, and that's the way power-based training sessions should go. You know, maximal output with adequate rest for maximal benefit. Um, now, I know this is only scratching the surface of power development, but I wanted to give you guys an idea of how power training and how power development works. Um, there's plenty more that could be discussed, um, and a lot of research studies to pour over to consider the full scope of uh, training for power. Uh, for more information on power development and training for power, I would reference many of our NSCA books like the Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning or Training for Power. And for specific questions on technique uh, for power or velocity-based exercises, you can check out a copy of uh, Exercise Technique Manual for Resistance Training or search our YouTube channel for our Technique Tuesday video series. Thanks again for watching everyone uh, and I look forward to seeing you next time on another edition of Learning with Human Kinetics.